We've just heard God's powerful word read, and we've sang to one another songs of devotion to Christ, proclaiming truths about Christ and his gospel together. Each week, we do this. Each and every week, we come to church as the church and hear these glorious truths. We see God revealed in his word. We proclaim Jesus and his death together in the Lord's Supper. If you've grown up in the church, kids, students, even adults, if this isn't your first time in church, you know so much truth. Each week, one of your pastors stands up here, as I'm doing today, and we use a piece of bread and a, a cup full of juice, and we remember Jesus. We proclaim his death together, and you hear the gospel proclaimed. You see in God's word, Jesus revealed. You learn of God's holiness. You learn of your sinfulness. And you hear the gospel, God's power, the wisdom of God and the power of God for those who would believe. This is an amazing privilege. And you and I are now responsible for what we hear, for what we know. If you're like me and you started a, restarted a Bible reading plan with the new year, I'm in McShane's. I know a number of you are in plans that take you through the Bible in a year. And many of you started Matthew, which means that last week, like me, you read Matthew chapter 11. And I want us to open there. If you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles up front and some men who would love to give those to you. If you don't have a Bible, please keep this. Please read it. Um, and if you don't have a Bible with you today, just raise your hand and they will put that in your hand. So Jesus spent much of his ministry in the cities around the, city of, in, around the Sea of Galilee. And most of his mighty works had been done in this region. Crowds flocked to him. In fact, a very often repeated word in the book of Matthew is the word crowds. You can't miss it as you're reading. Jesus was doing miracles and he was teaching and he was constantly surrounded by crowds. Lots of people. There were crowds everywhere. Thousands were excited. They were excited to hear Jesus' teaching. The word marvel is often used. Amazed. The crowds were marveling. The crowds were amazed. The crowds were leaving their homes and following Jesus out into the wilderness. They were packing homes, uh, houses full. They would go wherever Jesus went to see what he would do and to hear what he would teach. Blind men saw. Paralyzed men walked. Demons were cast out. Sicknesses were healed. Truth was taught. Loaves and fishes were multiplied. Dead people were even raised to life. This region was full of Jesus' enthusiasm. People who came to hear Jesus teach. Who came to see him do what he would do. People were listening. People were hearing. And amazed crowds were following him from city to city, marveling. And Jesus here is speaking to these crowds of people who'd shown up to hear his words and see his miracles. And his words to them might not be the words that you would think would be spoken to crowds like these. Read with me, starting in Matthew 11, verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. These cities were not marked by outright Jesus rejection, like the Pharisees. They weren't marked by Jesus persecution. They were maybe even marked by Jesus' miracles enthusiasm. But what these cities who heard Jesus clearly preach and saw clear evidences of who he was, what were they not marked by? 
repentance. They wouldn't have been able to sing the song that we just sang. All I have is Christ. They maybe wanted to add a little bit of Christ to their life. See if he could make their life a little better. Give them some food. Heal their sicknesses. Teach with power. Maybe even free them from Roman oppression. But they were not marked by repentance. They were not marked by obedience. The Bible repeatedly warns us about being hearers of the word, but not doers. Those who sit under God's teaching, even acknowledge it as true, but go away having forgotten what it revealed about who you are and your need. You might be here today impressed by the music or perhaps attracted to good doctrine or clear expositional preaching. Maybe you come to Grace Bible Church to enjoy the fellowship, the friendship, the kindness, the love, the camaraderie that accompanies the gathering of the body of Christ. Maybe you know that you're not happy and your life is unfulfilled and you come to church looking for answers. And you suppose Jesus is that answer, and you're not wrong in this. But be careful how you hear. It is not sufficient to be here, to nod in agreement, to know these truths. Listen to Jesus' next words with me, and soberly analyze your heart. He said, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. These were two of the cities where Jesus did most of his works. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, these were two Gentile cities marked by godlessness, regularly the the object of prophetic derision. If those things occurred in those cities, they would have repented long ago with sackcloth and ashes. And these people showed up and listened and walked away unchanged. Jesus makes his point even more remarkably at the end of verse 23 and 24. He says, if these miracles had occurred in Sodom, that's the epitome of moral evil, so wicked that in the days of Abraham and Lot, God destroyed it with fire in heaven. If anybody was wicked and godless, it was the Sodomites. If the Sodomites had had the privilege of seeing what the people of Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum had seen, they would have repented. Church, you have heard the power of God unto salvation. A privilege that Tyre, Sidon, Sodom didn't have. And Jesus says to the people of Capernaum, the listeners here, it would be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. There's nothing meritorious or righteous in hearing God's words and showing up. God will only declare people righteous on the basis of faith. This faith needs what you're hearing. You need to know the gospel in order to express faith in Jesus. But hearing it, And going away unchanged, being a hearer and not a doer, not turning to Christ, not dying to yourself, dying to this world, becoming a slave to the very good master Christ, turning to Jesus with all of your heart and repentance and faith. Without that, you're in no better place than these people who are in a worse place than the Sodomites. MacArthur comments on this passage. He says, when people have a great opportunity to hear God's word and even to see it miraculously demonstrated, their guilt for rejection is intensified immeasurably. It's far better to have heard nothing of Christ than to hear the truth about him and reject him. This might not be an outright rejection, Maybe just an indifference that doesn't affect your life. Makes you not turn from sin. Let's you be comfortable to live a life not worthy 
of the gospel that you've heard. The greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility. The greater the light, the greater the punishment for not receiving it. So in a moment, just like every single week, you will have a piece of bread and a cup of juice in front of you. We proclaim the Lord's death together when we take this. And these are physical reminders of Jesus' body and blood spilt. And if you respond to Jesus, to the remembrance of Jesus with anything short of complete life-changing devotion to him in faith marked by repentance, on the day of judgment, the books will be opened and you will face Jesus as judge. But if you see your sinfulness and need for a savior, if you look at your life and see sin and say, there's one more thing to repent of, one more thing to confess, he is faithful and he is just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that faith, that repentance will be marked by a life of repentance. And then your name will be indelibly written in the Lamb's book of life. All of your wicked deeds will be blotted out and nailed to the cross on which Christ died, cleansed by his blood, and you will be treated as the adopted child of Christ, child of God that you have become. So if you're a Christian, when the bread and juice comes, please take it. Evaluate your life. Are you in danger of being like those of Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, who hear with amazement, who are interested, but don't respond with the repentance of faith. Remember Jesus, evaluate your life, confess your sins, and then enjoy Jesus proclaiming his death for you as you take the bread in remembrance of him together. But if you recognize that you're more like these amazed but unrepentant crowds, these interested but ultimately indifferent people who flock to Jesus, Don't take heart in your religious efforts. Don't try to do better. Turn to him. Repent. Let the bread and juice pass and don't leave here today without speaking to me. Praying with the servants who are going to be up front on your left after the service. Don't heap more judgment on yourself by taking the bread and juice in an unworthy manner and leaving the proclaiming of God's word unchanged. Rather, turn today and receive new life, forgiveness in God himself through repentance and faith. John Calvin said, we know that believers are not only required to exercise repentance for a few days, but to cherish it incessantly till death. Christians, let's walk in the repentance by which we've been saved through faith, and let's remember Christ together. Men, please serve us. Take communion on your own when you're prepared.